Hello, everyone. You know, attempts to deceive are literally everywhere. My wife just recently got a call, and um, it was purportedly from the Social Security Administration. And uh, my wife got a call saying that her Social Security number had been suspended. And uh, press 1 if you'd like to learn more about this, what to do about it. Well, that was a scam. Social Security departments, don't administrations, don't cancel, don't suspend your Social Security number. And they certainly aren't going to ask for any, in, in, any information. So we did not. We did not call back. There is no problem with the Social Security number. And in fact, they said uh, to report the scam to oig.ssa.gov if that's happening to you immediately. Try to get the number of the person calling or the entity calling. And a lot of times they are non-registered numbers, but OIG, SSA, GOV. OIG dot SSA dot GOV is what I should have said. I think we can show you a picture of the uh, scam alert that we got from the Social Security Administration. So apparently it wasn't just us getting this. We also get frequent calls saying that our Amazon has this huge bill on it for 1200 or whatever. And we thought it looked suspicious and we thought we better call you. So uh, they need to talk to me about it. Those are scams too. And so it's always happening. Scripture tells us to prove all things, test all things, check it out. I'm bringing these temporal, physical examples up because the better we learn to spot deception anywhere, we can apply the principles a lot of times also to deception spiritually. So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields. I'm host and founder of Light on the Rock, where we glorify God our Father. And Jesus Christ, Yeshua, I call him, as our light of the world and as the rock. And so um, what I'm going to, what I'm uh, just described are not big religious deceptions, but ones we should be aware of anyway. We just posted a, a uh, blog on the website about how to avoid cyber crime. My webmaster, Scott Doucette, uh, put it together. I almost said Doucette. <laughs> But anyway, Scott Doucette put it together, and I hope you'll read it, and it will certainly help you from the things I'm talking about. So let's today continue along the theme of what I started last time about the massive end-time deception that will come when the beast system and the great false prophet come together, and the whole world is deceived. I read a bunch of scriptures last time, so I'm hoping you'll certainly copy and uh, study that first sermon first. Let's get back to Christ's warning in Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, don't believe it. False Christ, false prophets will rise and show great signs, great ones, great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So that's part of what he's saying here, too, is you need to take heed of what I'm saying to you. You need to take note of it because these things are going to happen. So we'll continue down that theme. And today it's about five points or steps that we can take to be sure, be absolutely sure we won't be deceived. Too many believers reacted, by the way, in the last U.S. national election in such a way uh, where some believe that it would be a different outcome. Some, many believe that the military would get in and change things. Uh, even long after the inaugural address. So we've got to be aware deception's possible because I watched it. Uh, you know, I kind of, I, was kind of, I myself was kind of like a fish playing with a uh, bait on a hook, just nibbling at it. I wouldn't take the hook. I, I, you know, I didn't quite believe the whole thing, but I wanted to see what people were saying and everything. And it made me aware we've got to be more careful than that. So even the elect come close to being deceived. Remember, the elect are the gods are God's children, uh, those who have been led by God's Holy Spirit, are the children of God. They're holy and sanctified. Later in Matthew 24, it says that the angels come and gather the elect at Christ's coming and, and, and bring him up to him. Matthew 24, 31. The angels gather the elect and bring them up to, uh, to meet Christ in the air. So the elect are those who will be resurrected and brought to Christ at his coming. And they are holy people, and uh, they came very close to being deceived, I think, in some ways. Let's not let that happen. 
Uh, so let's learn to fight the continual deceptions that we have. Look at your dollar bill. For I think what's happening, I'm going to talk about it for the next five minutes or so. What's happening is that the G7 countries and others are starting to work together to have this new world order that they've talked about, wanted to have for 30, 40, 50 years now, maybe longer. Look at the dollar bill. If we can show that uh, where the pyramid is, and right around it, you'll see the Latin words for Novus Ordo Seclorum. And it means New World Order. It's right on our dollar bill. I'll give a full sermon sometime about how that the stage is being very definitely set for a one world, one world, new world order. And we'll talk about that. I think everything we see happening today, not just here, but in Europe and in Israel and other places, we, we see things happening that are setting the stage, as I call it, setting the stage so that when the new world order is ready, to, when the beast power is ready to uh, reveal himself and the great false prophet ready to reveal himself, the stage has been set, kind of like going to a big play and it's all ready to go. So anyway, I, I don't even open emails that are offering me something that I didn't ask for. The last thing you want is to be connected to somebody who's going to try to put a dangerous ransom malware on your computer. So be sure you read the blog, Avoiding Cybercrime. I want to talk about a few other things. Surveillance is everywhere. Everywhere. Facial recognition software certainly is going on. And so we're seeing how governments and uh, around the world are are gaining control of vast populations under cover of COVID-19 as being the reason. They need emergency powers. And people are letting it happen. Lockdowns, wearing masks outdoors, inoculating children, they want to anyway, and teenagers, they're the least susceptible to this COVID-19. They're the least ones who ever... They're not dying from it. The most of them who get it don't even know they had it. And now, even people I love dearly, 13 years old or whatever, wants to, my family, thinking of getting COVID shot for a 13-year-old. Even who? The, the World Health Organization, WHO. Even they say it is not safe enough for those who are in their teens or, or younger. Not safe enough. And yet people are giving into it, giving into the fear. Mandatory vaccination, passports, vaccination passports, control. The, the, the G7 wants to have control. So it's a standardized rule that you can't even fly here and there unless you show your vaccination passport. Show me your papers. Doesn't that sound like Germany in the 30s and 40s? Personal data, huge amounts of it are being volunteered being given voluntarily by a lot of people with their smartphones and smart uh, smart watches. Uh, they're watching everything you put, you search on Google. It's recorded somewhere. Every email you send, everything you look up, everything you watch, it's all being recorded. And we have laptops and we have computers with, com with cameras on them. They're watching you. They are, or they can. Now there's smart cameras supposedly on these smart TVs. And they're talking about putting them in, if they're not already in refrigerators and microwaves and so on. So they watch everything you do. We have, you know, Alexa and all of that listening in to every little thing. I am, I am getting really tired of it. But it's going to get worse and worse. There's a move to cashless society. See, when you pay cash, they can't track you down. There's no record of it uh, as a, compared to a credit card or something like that. And people are even letting their smartphones and their cell phones and, and their smart watches be able to do the transactions. Everything's being handed over to big tech. This eventually allows them to know everything about you. And when the time comes to round up God's people, it won't be hard. How many times are you listed on someone as a friend on Facebook? It won't be hard. I'm even thinking of coming off Facebook. I really am. So the stage is being set for worldwide deception to be easier and easier to do. The media has become a microphone for the far left. Schools and universities have long played that role. It's only because of COVID-19 that we've become very much aware 
of what our kids are being taught at school. Uh, they're not being thought, thought, talk, uh, thought, they're not being taught any longer how to think, but what to think, what to think. There was a girl who came over from North Korea, someone who had, who had returned, who had gotten out of the country and come to uh, Georgetown University. And she was just appalled that if she asked any questions, she was told, no, you, you can't ask that question. And she wrote something about how, I want to know, uh, I don't know, I don't want to know what to think. I want to know how to think. I want to be able to ask questions. Anyway, holograms uh, are being perfected. Let's see if we can show you just for a minute or two, some of these holograms, they can be, we can go ahead and start, uh, let me say something first. Uh, you won't know if they're real or not. We're almost at that point already. I didn't realize we're that far advanced in holograms. There's work to be done on that too, of course, but uh, we better know our God and his word because these aren't just magic acts anymore that I'm talking about. I'll put on the website a link where you can watch what we'll show you a couple minutes of right here. Thinking outside the box? Take a look inside this one. Stand out in a crowded marketplace with Portal. You're not seeing double. He's being beamed into Portal via live telepresence. Anyone can beam into the unit remotely from anywhere in the world, in real time. The built-in front-facing camera and stereo speakers allow for live audience interaction. From humans to animated characters, the possibilities are endless and a touchscreen display allows users to interact with custom content. There's even a mini version that can be used in smaller spaces. As Portal inventor David Nussbaum says, if you can't be there, beam there. This is Portal. What'd you think of that? The holograms that are so real. Are you being deceived? Are you deceived already? Can you ever be deceived? Remember, nobody who is deceived realizes they're deceived. That's why they're deceived. I want you to think about that. They don't see it. If you're deceived, you won't see it either. Even those doing the deceiving are deceived themselves. Look at what it says here in 2 Timothy 3.13. They believe their own deceptions. 2 Timothy 3.13 says evil men will get worse and worse. Here it is, evil men and imposters. 2 Timothy 3.13 will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. So if you're deceived, you won't even know you're deceived, or you might even be deceiving someone else and not knowing that you yourself are deceived. So it's very important that we understand that this end time deception from the beast system, beast meaning the government, probably centered in Europe, is already being set up as we speak. Don't be cocky that it can't happen to you. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. So why do you need this topic? Why is this important to you? Why should you spend your time with it? Well, Revelation 14, let's read something here. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12. It says, Anybody who gets the mark of the beast or worships the beast or gets involved in Satan's Babylon in a full full-blown way, is really in trouble with God. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, Revelation 14, verse 9, If anyone, that's you, that's me, anyone, worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, if they start talking about giving you these chips that can go in your hand or in the forehead or scalp or someplace, I'm not doing it. If he receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, verse 10, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength, full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Whatever you think of the uh, fire and brimstone and lake of fire, anything like that, although it doesn't say lake of fire here, God is really, really ticked off, really mad, really angry. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So we don't want to do it. And I'm convinced, we, uh, I don't, I'm convinced that we won't accidentally do it. I, I'm convinced that God's children uh, or anybody um, 
uh, who studies God's word, uh, many of them will understand. This sounds like something I've read in scripture. So let's not, let's be very careful about this. Now, verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So also remember that those who uh, worship, who don't worship the beast system and the, go along with what they're making us do, unless God supernaturally protects us, those of God's people, it says so many places in Daniel and Revelation 13 and other places, those God's children will be killed. I, I just want you to, be, to know that many righteous people are going to die. This notion that we'll all be given a place of safety or be raptured up to heaven, how do you, how do you equate that with all of the martyrs, the righteous people, the saints, it calls them in Daniel 7, who are killed by this system? So we need to resolve right now that it comes down to us dying for God, who died for us, and not going along with the beast system and the mark and all that, we need to resolve that in our minds right now, that that's what we're going to do. We're not going to go along with that. We're going to be faithful to God. Also in Revelation 16, it talks about the seven last plagues, the seven last bold plagues being poured out. I think you guys should be reading Revelation a lot right now. And Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Revelation 13. Be reading those until you can almost say them by heart so that when these things start to happen, you'll say, yeah, I remember that. Okay, I'm aware of that. Revelation 16. There's seven angels pouring out seven last plagues. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. I don't want that. So God's wrath is being poured out. It's worse than what the beast can do. All they can do is kill me. God resurrects me into a beautiful spirit a being body with brilliance and brightness and power. No more pain, no more sorrow, eternal life. I'll take that. I'll take that any day. And I want to wake up all of us to wake up to understand the stage is being set and you better wake up and I better wake up, all of us, all of us. And those who become enmeshed in the world's Babylon, Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, lest you partake of her plagues. Lest you partake of her plagues. Now I want to give you something encouraging a little bit first. If you and I are a part of the children of God, the dedicated elect, who are actively, zealously seeking God, love God and his, and his word, and are obeying him, and we know him and he knows us, and we're praying and we're hearing his voice, and you know, strong thoughts and however else he talks to us, our Father will protect us from being deceived. Some of us will be martyrs. That might be an honor, frankly, that might be an honor. The early apostles thought it was a great honor to be beaten and have stripes, to be jailed for Yeshua, for Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not part of the elect and you walk away from God's revelations to you and his word, yeah, you're probably going to be part of the deceived. But listen to what uh, Jesus, Yeshua says in John 10, verses 27 to 30. The, the whole chapter of John 10 is about him being the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. Now there's a group of people in Matthew 7. He says, I've never known you, you workers of iniquity. Get out of here. Depart from me. But his real sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You have to ask yourself in your life right now, and this week, and last week, and last month, would an angel watching you and then appear to you, would they give you a grade of, yeah, you follow God? Or would they say, you know what, you're such a hypocrite. We all stop, and we all fail, we all slip sometimes, but the general pattern should be that we follow him. And Yeshua says, I give them eternal life, Jesus says, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand so I want to give you that encouragement. If we're fervent sheep of his pasture, I think we will not be deceived. I still want to give the sermon, though, to make sure we follow those steps. It all comes down to relationship. 
My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I hope that's encouraging to you. So let's focus on the ways that we can make sure that this is going to happen. But if you don't pray every day, if you're not asking God to speak to you, if you're not tuned in to his voice, by that I mean ask him to talk to you, ask him to put strong thoughts in your heart, in your head. And sometimes there'll be a thought come into your head that will be just so strong that you'll say, what on earth is happening there? I have a lady friend in the Netherlands and her husband, and one night, it was like 2 a.m. in the morning where I was, I was all done. I shut down the computer, started walking up to the, my bedroom, and uh, all of a sudden, this real strong thought. I, it was almost like I was hearing a voice, but I, no one else would have heard it, and it wasn't a voice like that. It was just a strong thought. Go check your email. I kept going four or five feet, and I heard it again. Go check your email. I looked up. Is that you? Okay, I went back down, turned the computer back on, checked it, and this woman from the Netherlands wanted to talk to me urgently. I don't go into the personal things right now, but God wanted me to talk to her and to assure her, encourage her. She was not forgotten by God. God was still hearing her words. She was saying, I think God's maybe cut me off. I said, are you kidding me? At 2 a.m. my time, he told me to come and check my email. And I, that's happened so many times that I want you to learn to hear his voice. I have sermons on hearing God's voice. I just put it in the search bar and look it up. So how are you going to avoid being deceived? Okay, number one, pray to be filled with God. <laughs> with God, the Holy Spirit, which is God in us. Pray, to, pray that God comes into your heart, comes into your life. We know he does with his spirit. And you know what happens when he gives us his spirit? It says in 1 John, I think it's in chapter 4 and other places in 1 John, that we also are in God. We also are in God by his spirit. And Colossians 3.3 3 says we're able to be in God because we're in Christ who is in God. And so, you know, I, I have sermons also on what it means to be in God, in Christ if that's a new concept to you, but be, pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God said, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, I want to give it to you. Our, my Father wants to give it to you. Ask. You know, if you will give your, your child or somebody uh, a, piece of, you know, a piece of bread or fish or whatever else, God wants to give you his Holy Spirit. That's in Matthew, I think it's in Matthew 7 that he says that. We must come to know, really, really know our God. Be in tune with his Spirit. God's Spirit will tell us what to say in hard and difficult times. In Mark 13, in Mark 13, um, verses 11 to 13, let's put it up there. I'll, I'll, I'll just, just be reading it now as I talk about it. He says, when they arrest you and deliver you up, don't worry about what you're going to say. You know, if you're being arrested, especially for believing in Christ or believing in God's Word and the values of the Bible, don't worry about it. Just say, Father, I'm going to take your word in Mark 13 that you said you would give me the words to say. So whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. I have that in bold. Speak that, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. It's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death. Father his child. The children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. I mean, they trust this peace system so much. Now, this is being set up right now. This administration in 2021 is going to spend $100 million, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, basically rewarding those who rat out anybody who they suspect are conservatives, love the Bible, might be Trump supporters, and uh, my father hasn't had his shot, or my brother uh, is a Trump supporter. The stage is being set, folks. Right now in America, it's being set. Whether you believe me or not, Yeshua says it's going to happen that within families, people will cause each other to be put to death, and, they, and then you'll be hated for, by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So how do you get filled with God's Spirit? That's a whole different topic, but repent. 
Turn around. Go the other way. Believe God. Follow him. I've had to repent many times of many things. But there comes a point where you say, I'm tired of going the other way, Father. I want to be your child and obey you. And you turn around. You repent. And then you're baptized. You're immersed. And then you have the laying on of hands and um, to receive the Holy Spirit. And then be sure you're walking in obedience because the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey God. Acts 5.32. Keep asking constantly, daily maybe even, constantly for more of the Holy Spirit. Every day, he wants us to have it. We, you have not for you ask not, you know, says in James chapter 4. And Paul said his biggest goal was that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3, 9. That I may know him. He wanted to know Yeshua. He wanted to know the Father. I have a friend named Mike who said this. He says, my opinion about this, how we keep from ever being deceived. He says, my opinion comes down to John 10, 27, which we read earlier. Hearing his voice, him knowing us, and we follow him. How do we do this? We need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Mike says, good friend of mine, and be filled with him. Knowing 100%, we are filled with his spirit, 100%. That's, in my opinion, the key of how we avoid being deceived. I mean, Mike says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. I agree with him, which is God in us and hear his voice. I break it up into two points. The first one is be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the second one is pray and listen. Number one, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're not, repent, be baptized, get the laying on of hands, be obedient to him so you keep the Holy Spirit inside of you. Even David said, take not your spirit from me when he'd gone a long time in, in uh, hypocrisy and hiding uh, the murder that he had done of Uriah. So you have to keep that active and flowing. Point number two is pray and listen. Ask to hear our beloved master's voice. Follow him. Please talk to me, Lord Jesus. Please talk to me, Father. And let me be so in tune to you like the old-fashioned radios where we had to dial in, you know, change the... We had to dial in to the, to the station. If any of you under 50 may not know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But anyway, John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. I have sermons on hearing God's voice, so make sure you check those out. And so many times, Yeshua, the Son of God, says, Take heed. Maybe you know, if you have a concordance uh, way of looking up things and on, your, on your laptop, type in uh, Take Heed and see if it comes up in your Bible programs. Listen, pay attention, watch out. Be on guard for, be listening to the right voice, we're told over and over again. So this second point is pray that you hear his voice. Pray that you hear his voice. Pray and study a lot, and that God will help you detect error, that God will reveal the truth to you. Play the Bible. I mean, I have the Bible that I study at my desk every day, but also I have many translations and versions on audio. Because I find that by, by listening to various translations and versions, it hits different buttons for me. So I'm playing them as I'm weeding or as I'm getting ready for bed. And I'll typically play the same chapter three times. So by the third time, I'm able to almost say it along with it. Or at least I know what's coming up next. And I'll, I'll find that, boy, I'd forgotten that that was there, right there in the Bible like that. Remember the seven churches of Revelation three and of Revelation two and three. At the end of each section, it says, uh, "Let him who has an ear to hear, hear, listen, tune into what the Spirit says to the churches." So we, we make sure you're listening. Pray and listen as you pray. When you pray, I like to stop. I've said this many times. I like to stop and I'll say, "Father, I want to shut up now." I want you to talk to me. And I get out my notebook and my pen. And frankly, honestly, sometimes nothing comes to my head. But then other times I'm writing like crazy. Or sometimes the strong thoughts will come a day or later, a week later. But, but I'm asking him to speak to me. I'm asking him to help me be tuned in to him. And as you pray, stop and pause. Ask him to speak to you. As you study, after you read a few verses, 
stop, look up, or bow your head and look down. <laughs> what are you telling me here, Father? How does this apply to me? What do you want me to get from this? Speak to me. And you'll be amazed how he'll speak to you through your children sometimes, through neighbors, through events, through the, the word of God, uh, through sermons you hear. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Point number three. Point number two was to listen. Listen to his voice. Make sure you're hearing his voice. Pray and listen. Ask to hear your beloved's voice. Point number three is similar, but I want to focus it a little differently. We need to know God's word. Now, this point number two is I'm saying, I want you to get to the point where you are hearing him speak to you. He does speak. He hasn't gone mute. He hasn't gone to a nursing home. He hasn't lost his miracle working powers. Point number three is know his word so well that you recognize any mounting deception that's beginning to happen around you. Yeshua says, remember, he said at the end of that section about the elect getting close to being deceived, he said, see, I've told you. Why would he say that? Unless it's important that we know his words. Know what he said. Yeshua also said that he's the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth is his word. My, your word is truth. Isn't that somewhere in John 17? <laughs> Or somewhere in there, thy word is truth. And uh, the, the, the truth will set you free. How are you going to avoid the end time deception unless you're really deeply, often, constantly in the word of God? Every single day without exception. I've been talking a lot lately about praying and studying like never before in several of my recent sermons. God has put that on my heart. That's what I'm hearing him tell me to tell you. All of us get into the Word much, much, much more deeply than we ever have before. Cut out a lot of TV. Cut out a lot of Facebook time. Maybe cut it all out. Get into God's Word. Time is short. Real short. I'll give a sermon soon, too, of uh, can Christ come at any time now? The answer is no. He's not going to come tonight, tomorrow night, or whatever. But, but it is soon. And I want to give a sermon on that. So... First and Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. Paul says to the people who were overly concerned about the second coming of Messiah that Satan is going to give tremendous power to false miracle, the false prophet. The miracles will not be illusions. They'll be true. So Second Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10. We'll put that on the screen right now. The coming of the lawless. I want you to see that lawless one, the man of iniquity, the lawless one, anarchist, will be according to the working of Satan. It's going to be Satan's own power. He's got a lot of power. With all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because, I want you to hear this now, they got deceived, he says, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You've got to love God's word. You've got to be like a deer panting by the brooks, hot middle of the day and needing some water real bad. And God's word washes us. God's word feeds us. It's bread. It's washing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Let's get into it. Notice the ones who are deceived are those who don't have a love for the truth, that they might be saved. So know God's word. Know it real well. That's why I listen to the same chapter three times if I'm doing the audible. If I'm at my desk, I can study and focus a lot more. But uh, hearing it three times, I, 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 I can tell you what that chapter is about. So know what we're told about the beast and the false prophet. Know the truth about the issues. I want to talk about the lukewarm church at the very end of Revelation 3, Laodiceans. <laughs> to the Philadelphians, he says, I'm coming soon. To the Laodiceans, he's saying, I'm here. I'm at the door. I'm knocking at the door. Think about that now. It does appear that that final group of people in the very end time, it might be us. It might be us. But they're all being told to repent of their lukewarmness. 
it makes them gag. It says you're like tepid coffee or tea. It's not hot. It's not cold. It just makes me gag. Why do I want to vomit? So he's not very pleased with this end time. He says, but if you repent, if you become zealous, if you turn from being lukewarm and become red hot, I will invite you and have supper with you. I'll sit down with you and share my throne with you. So it's not too late, late of sins. If you realize you've been lukewarm, it's not too late. But don't wait any longer. So be in God's word every single day. Make it your habit. If it's not, change it. It takes about three weeks to set a habit. I have a friend in uh, Florida, uh, Dave, who wondered out loud, by the way, something I thought was interesting. What if the beast and false prophet gain our confidence by being conservative and reestablish the rule of law again and bring peace to the world, law and order to the world, prosperity to the world? What did Yeshua say? He said, like in the days of Lot, they were building houses and marrying and giving in marriage, planting vineyards. And then in one day, boom, it all changed. I think Dave might be onto something. I think it could be a good point. That's not what we're expecting, that he's going to establish the true rule of law, God's law. He's a, the Bible calls him man of sin. The Bible calls him uh, the lawless one. But the Bible also tells us that it will be a time of peace and safety and then sudden destruction. I talked about that last time. So no matter what he says, we have to know that his goal is a world that he dominates, where he proclaims that he is God. He is God, sitting in the very temple as God, and he will kill anyone who goes against him. Any true believers who aren't being protected by God will be killed. Now remember God's two witnesses going on at the same time, Revelation 11, verses 1 to 5. They're not well liked. Why aren't they well liked? Because they're calling for plagues as often as they want, it says. And water being turned to blood and fire and fire coming out of their mouth somehow, whatever that means. It may not be literal, but it might be literal. And whoever comes to attack them must be killed in this way. So they're killing people. They're, these are God's final two witnesses. And they're causing plagues all over. And water being turned to blood and so on. And people dying. But the false prophet will be very well liked. He deceives people into liking him. The Bible says he has the look of a lamb, but he speaks the words of a dragon, the dragon. Revelation 13, 11. So the world likes him. On top of that, he does all these incredible signs and wonders, like calling down fire from heaven, which always in Bible times when fire came from heaven, was like the miracle of Elijah, was like the miracle of Solomon. Uh, Solomon's day, when the, the temple of God was being dedicated, as Solomon had built, when Moses' tabernacle was ready to be officially opened, fire came down from heaven. So people who don't know the word, even those who do know the word, will, will say, look, these are signs that he's like Elijah, he's like the true prophet. And who else is, can, can call down fire from heaven? God's answering his prayers. Be so convincing that even the very elect come close. I'm committing myself that I'm not going to get deceived. I'm hoping that you commit yourself to that too. So know God's word. That's how Yeshua battled Satan. Turn these stones into bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Deuteronomy 8.3. You know? And then he says, uh, I'll give you all these kingdoms. If, or I think before that he said, uh, you, take, you take him to a high tower, throw yourself down because God says he won't let you, if you're really the son of God, he won't let you dash your toe against a, a rock. And he says, don't tempt God. From, he gives a scripture on that. And then also, just worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Yeshua says, get behind me, Satan, get out of here. So worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now get Completely demolished, body slam Satan. So that's why we got to answer temptations as well by God's word. You're being tempted into a, a, a sin. 
The Bible, just the verse that comes to mind, flee temptation. Get out of here. Get out of here. Or stories in the Bible of how people handle temptations. So point number one, ask for more of God's Spirit to fill you with God Himself inside of you. Point number two, listen for God's voice with full focused attention. And He will speak to you if you tune in. Point number three, know His Word inside out. Know it really, really well. Start studying, folks. A lot more Bible study. And I don't mean when I say do more Bible study that you're just listening to sermons all the time, including my own. What I'm saying is your own personal time in the Bible. Your own personal time in the Bible. Verse by verse by verse. Make sure you're doing that. Point number four, obey God's word. Now this is where Eve went bad. Obey God's word. It's not enough to know God's word. You've got to do it, not just be a hearer only. We have to obey him and his word. This is harder to do than it seems. Eve knew the truth. She told the truth to Satan. We're not allowed to eat of that one tree. We can eat the, all the other trees, but not this one tree. So she knew the truth. The truth should set you free, but I think you put all the verses together on it. The truth sets us free if we obey the truth. She didn't obey. The truth that she did know. She didn't do the truth she knew. So she ended up being deceived. Look at James 1.22. We'll put it up here. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. You can hear God's word and you can hear it from the pulpit. You can hear it in sermons. You can read it in the Bible. And you're thinking, okay, I'm pretty close to God. I spent half an hour in my Bible study today or more. But you don't do it. I preach to myself if I don't do it. In fact, I'll be given a double whammy because I'm teaching it. Teachers are going to be held more accountable, it says in James 3. The complete Jewish Bible version on James 1.22 says, Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the Word says, but do it. Eve heard and Eve knew God's Word, but didn't obey it. So she ended up deceived. Adam wasn't deceived, and he still went ahead, so he had even the, the worst of the sins. Now, here's something else that has to happen. You know Satan is the big deceiver. You know who another deceiver is? Me, to myself, you, to yourself. We deceive ourselves. Jeremiah 17.9 says the heart, the old carnal heart, not God's new heart, but the old carnal heart, is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Now that's an old, unconverted, carnal, fleshly heart that we had, we have had, we still have. But God's given us a clean heart, a new heart. Like David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Okay, Restore a right spirit within me. Take not your spirit from me, Psalm 51. So we have two natures now in Galatians 5, just before it talks about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, or the fruit of the flesh, works of the flesh. Just before that, Paul says, these two are battling each other all the time, kind of like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde inside of us. There's the carnal side that wants to lust, wants to steal, wants to lie, wants to be lazy, wants to break the Sabbath. So we have other things we'd rather do. And there's the spiritual side saying, no, no, stop it. We're going to keep the Sabbath. We're going to obey God. We're going to, we're going to act like we're holy elect of God. We're not going to give in to this temptation or that one. And it's whoever, whichever side you give attention to will be the side that wins. So when we're tempted to sin and we justify doing the sin, it's that old heart speaking and you're listening to it. So, for example, if you're being tempted to um, break the Sabbath, uh, after all, I do have to provide for my family. I know it's sundown already, but I, I, I'm going to stay here at work longer. God will understand. I can always repent. Or you're being tempted to tell a small lie, still a lie. 
or to flirt with someone else's wife at work or some other place, or to look at porn or movies that are not in tune to God's way of thinking, or drink more than you should, if at all, if you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't, or to take something not belonging to us, like God's tithe and offerings, to be unkind to our husband or our wife, instead of loving her like Christ does the church. So when we have these temptations, God's word should be flowing through our mind powerfully to say, I'm going to tune in to God in his way, I'm going to reject the other one, build the character that comes from that. And um, so anyway, another point I want to make, make here is that Eve was allowed to be deceived. God did not intervene because we have free moral agency. We have free choice. And when we go against God's will for us, because we have free choice, even God postpones or alters the will that he had set for us. Many examples of that in Scripture. Do you think God's will is always done? Everyone says yes. I say no, it's not. Otherwise, why do we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Why would we pray for that? If Do you ever pray that the sun rise tomorrow? You don't, because you, you know it's going to. If God's will is always done on earth, why pray for it? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Mark 6, the first six verses, even Yeshua, the Son of God, it says, could not do any miracles except a very few in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. Faith is very strong. Even negative faith is very super strong. Even Jesus could not heal, would not, could not heal people in Nazareth. Luke 13, 34. This is getting near the end of Yeshua's life. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's sobbing, weeping over Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets. Luke 13, 34. And, and, and stones those who are sent to her. How often my will was, I wanted. That's my, God's will. It's what he wants, what his desire is. My will was to gather you all like your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But you were not willing. You were not willing. How tragic. It's God, if God honored their free, their free choice, their, their free will, God was doing that then. He does the same to you and me. So we might, we've got to make sure that we're listening in real, real tight. Finally, point number five, ask God to protect you from being deceived. Ask God to protect you from being deceived. You know in the Lord's Prayer, at the end of it, Matthew 6, 13, deliver us from the evil one, as I think it really means, deliver us from evil. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, I got this from a wonderful friend in Arizona who sent me this verse for this sermon along with other excellent points. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 in the NIV, it says, but the Lord is faithful who will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. That's if we're seeking him and asking him to protect us. I like John 17, 15, too, in Yeshua's priestly prayer. Um, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I love Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. I'm speeding up a little bit for time's sake here. I pray to Yeshua directly. Yes, I do pray to him as well as the Father. And I'll say, Yeshua, please, my master, my savior, please pray for me, intercede for me, act for me. I often feel Satan's after me. You probably feel that too. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, when you've repented, when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Father, please, I just pray this. Understand we're but flesh. I know you do. Keep us from the evil one. I have a sister in Arizona who believed like Mike did also. She also believes in John 10, 27. I'll put her quote up on the screen. The key, of course, is to not be deceived. 
is, is, is our relationship with our Heavenly Father and His Son Yeshua, our Savior and King. John 10, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, they'll follow me. But if we won't listen or don't listen, we won't hear. We need to immerse ourselves in God's Word every day in Scripture and prayer to hear God's leading. If we do that and are connected to God, I mean really connected in a close personal relationship, I don't see how being deceived would be possible. In so many scriptures, God tells us to be strong and courageous. We can't be strong or courageous. I think it's a great point. We can't be strong and courageous as we might have to be without his help. So we need to be very mindful of not neglecting our calling and losing that connection. At one time, I used to be concerned about the mark of the beast, that it might not be obvious, or we, God's people, might be deceived or forced against our will into accepting it. I have to come to believe that won't be the case. I know now that it will be a knowing and deliberate decision. You might still be forced to either be, uh, that's me talking now, to either be killed or, or take this mark, but it won't be by being fooled into it in our case. We will know. So I think now will be a knowing and deliberate decision on our part if we accept it or reject it. God's true elect won't come under the beast system, but it will be so deceptive, we'll have to be totally on our guard. I think she encapsulated beautifully what I've been trying to say. I agree totally with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I love it when you guys help me out there with sermon topics. I'll send out a note once in a while. I'm thinking of talking about this. Do you guys have any thoughts on it? It would be hard to be positive and courageous if you feared that you'll be deceived unknowingly. Okay, that's a good point. So be filled with God's Spirit, number one, and, and, and be following His lead. Be sure you listen for God's voice. Number two, make sure you know God's Word, number three, and will obey God's Word, number four, and pray for His protection against Satan and, and, and His deception. The good news is, In spite of all the martyrs that, that are going to be killed, there will be many, many killed. I do believe there will be a place of safety for those who are zealous. I do believe that. In Revelation 12 and Revelation 3 and other places, I believe there will be a place of safety for those who are red hot for God. But there will also be some end time martyrs. But at the end, let's, let's read this, Revelation 19, verse 20. And then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Justice is done. I said I believe many of God's children will have a place of protection. You can read that in Revelation 3. Let's put it up there right now. Revelation 3, verses 10 to 11. Because you've kept my command, this is said to the Philadelphian era or, or group of people who have that spirit, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, on the other hand, you go back to the end of Revelation 3. There's another group called the Laodiceans. And because they're lukewarm... Let's put that up there too as I speak here. Revelation 3, verses 14 to 20. Let's just scroll down. To the angel of the church, the messenger of the church of Laodiceans, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. I know your works, verse 15, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, but since you're lukewarm, I want to vomit you out. And because you think you're so good, you think you're, I'm rich, spiritually, physically, we become wealthy. That means God's blessing us. That's what you're saying. You don't need anything. You've got your 401k, your retirement, everything all squared away real nice. Everything's paid off. Your house is paid off. God must be blessing us because I must be righteous. And don't know you're wretched, miserable. Verse 17, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And he goes on from there, white garments and salve that you may see. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Verse 20, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. It goes on from there. Strong warnings. But I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. It's just a biblical way of saying 
you are going to be tested and tested and tested till I know that I know you and that you're zealous and that you won't, won't give this up for anything. So they will have to go through the fire. And we may have to go through various kinds of fires too. And at the end, we will be refined. We will be there. It seems to me, though, that it's very possible that many who are zealous for God will be given a place of safety. Let's not be deceived. Father, Holy Father in heaven, we come to you just thanking you so much for your word, your comforting words that we don't have to be deceived. We can know your word. We can be listening to you. We can have the Holy Spirit. Pour out your holy anointing, please, to all who are hearing this. And to all you wish to have God's, your spirit. Please, dear Father, let us hear your voice. Let us be tuned in to you. Please speak to us. Please work your miracles in our lives. Please pour out the fruit of the Spirit. Divide them up to us. Let us see them, all the various fruit of the Spirit. Let us obey your word, and please keep us from the evil one. Shine on us, Father. Father, please protect us now from COVID. Protect us from enemies. Protect those who are trying to make lists of conservative, Bible-obedient people. Protect us. Protect us. Give us faith and power and strength. Oh, how we love you, Father, and how we love you, Yeshua. Oh, how we love you. Help us love you more, much more. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. And amen. And amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.